I'm going to give you 3,000 years in 30 minutes. You ready? Uh, the Feast of Purim is a celebration where once again God delivered the Jewish people from certain destruction. Why is that important to us as Christians? Because no Jewish people, no Joseph, no Mary, no Jesus. There's an innate connection, an eternal connection between the forces. Somebody prayed war in the heavenlies. It's not a, it's anti-Semitism is not a political issue. It's a spiritual issue that has to do with war in the heavenlies over who will be worshipped on planet earth. Will it be God or some other demon or so? It will be God. It will be Jesus Christ. Amen. And so there's war in the heavenlies. Now the, the, the Megillah for Esther, the, the scroll, we call it the Megillah, the scroll. You ever, if you're from New York, you've heard this phrase. Hey, don't give me the whole Megillah. You know, just cut to the chase, right? Like in Israel, for me, they say, hey, I don't have all day. Would you please speak English? <laughs> we talk, talk about and we read the scroll of Esther. It's going to be hitting me, right? Well, you, then you can't give this to a Jew because we have to have our hands to talk. <laughs> Do you know why Jews have short necks? <laughs> the very name Esther has within it the, the, M, the, the S, T, and R sounds, the Samach, Tav, and Rosh in Hebrew that means hidden. And Esther is a mystery book. It took a long time to get canonized because the name of God is not mentioned. It's always behind the scenes in this book. It's an amazing mystery story. It also has within it the, the very word scroll, Megillah. Say Megillah. Megillah. Say Megillah Gorilla. Yeah. Probably cartoons drawn by Jews, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> Megillah Gorilla. The G-L-H sound, which means to reveal. So another way of even titling the book of Esther could be the revealing of the hidden. And there's a word for some of you here today. There are things that God has tucked in your heart that you've wondered, they've kind of languished, and you've wondered, is this really ever going to happen? What's it going to look like when it happens? Is it really going to happen? Is he still on this job? Is he still on the case? And this book is a testimony to us that God is working behind the scenes, regardless of what we see with our eyes. We walk by faith and not by sight. Amen? Amen. So it's also a season of generosity. What we do is we, we give portions for those to whom nothing has been prepared, as Nehemiah 8.10 says. And at the book of Esther, at the end of the book, it talks about how when they were delivered and they were celebrated, they sent gifts to one another. So it's a real celebratory time. There's two days of fasting and then a blowout. Uh, people think of it as the, the Jewish Halloween because everybody gets dressed up. We put on the whole play. Last Friday night at our congregation, we, did the, we read the whole Megillah. We put on the play, abridged version. Put on the play. We dress. When I, when I was raising my ch ch children, we would dress up and read the play with our kids. So, so uh, my... Younger son, my older son was Mordechai, and my wife, of course, was Esther. I'm, of course, Haman. And, and my youngest son is the king. <laughs> and so we typecast, but it's okay. And so we, we practice what's called Mishloach Manot. Try that, Mishloach. I should hear that, huh. It always sounds like ham. I said, ham. Mishloach Manot, which means the extending of portions generosity. So what we're doing, and you can help us if you want, we're sending an, an offering to Mount Carmel in Israel where there's a women's shelter that is primarily made up of African refugees who walked from Africa to Israel. Many of them, their husbands were killed along the way. Many of them were raped and arrived pregnant. And so there's this crop of beautiful young Ethiopian children that are on Mount Carmel being ministered to. And that's where I was mentored in some of these messages. So I have a real heart what they do there. It's a full orb ministry. So we're sending an offering to the women's shelter, which is primarily made up of African women in Mount Carmel, Israel. So this is a story of sowing and reaping. Jerry, can I get that water? My wife sends her greetings. She's skiing. We have this division in our marriage. She is a double black diamond skier, been skiing since she's three years old, and I am on the bunny slope. Must not fall, must not fall. 
So when she can go with a friend of hers, Michelle, who also can ski, she gets to go, which is very rare these days. It's been a couple of years, actually. So. 200 years before the, sto the story of Purim, uh, the P which this, this story takes place around 484 B.C., so about, you know, 5th century B.C., 484 B.C. It's a 10-year story, really. But 200 years... This is what the Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed one. This is the king of Persia whose right hand he will empower. Before him, mighty kings will be paralyzed with fear. Their fortress gates will be opened, never to shut again. This is what the Lord says. I will go before you, Cyrus, and level the mountains. I will smash down gates of bronze, cut through the bars of iron, and I'll give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret riches. I will do this so you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, who was this guy? In Hebrew, it's called Koresh. He says Cyrus in the King James. By the way, it was, it, King James put his name in the Bible. The real name that's in the Bible is Jacob. But James wanted to see his own name in the Bible. That's why we have that there. If you're a King James only, please forgive me. Don't stone me. Uh, 200 years before this man was born, Isaiah named him and called him and said what he would do. And what did he do? At sec in 2 Chronicles 36, 2 Chronicles 36, no, 2 Chronicles 22, verse 36 and 37. It's the end of the Hebrew Bible. We have the same Bible. The Old Testament, we have the same one, only ours is in a little different order. Our, our ends with 2 Chronicles. And it ends with the story of Cyrus. And what did Cyrus do? He decreed that the Jews could go back to Jerusalem from the Babylonian captivity, which is overtaken by Persia, and they could build the temple in Jerusalem. So check this out. If you're a Jewish kid from New York and you're wandering through the Bible because somebody told you Jesus was Lord and you're trying to prove them wrong, this is what you find out. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had gave through the prophets. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, now this man is not a believer in Jehovah. He's probably Zoroastrian. This is the Lord, the God of heaven. He's having revelation of the one true God. Has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go there for this task. And may the Lord God be with you. The very last verse is about cooperation between Persia and Israel. Why is that important? Because Persia is the semi-ancient name for Iran. The ancient, ancient name is Elam. You can read about it in, Gen in Jeremiah 49, the restoration of Elam that is coming. And Iran is having revival. They're having revival. I've been on television in Tehran. I'm telling you, they gather around the TV at night by satellite to hear in Farsi. And the question on their mind is, what must I do to be saved? Because the young people are sick of religious Islam. They want love. They want a future. They want technology. They want peace. They want, they want something new and better and different. They want Jesus. And that's what's happening in Iran. You won't hear about it much, but that is happening. <laughs> you turn over the, from 2 Chronicles 22, there's a white page there between Malachi, between, for us between, when you turn over the page, and Matthew 1.1 1, 1 is what? This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at those, we kind of go, and begat, and begat, and begat, and whatever, whatever, whatever. But when an Israeli looks at that, they get saved. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. What? The son of Abraham. What? The son of Adam, the son of God. What? 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 The genealogy means something to Israelis and to Jewish people when they get it by revelation. Because it points out to us in this divorce that has happened for 2,000 years, which God is now healing. The fact that I'm standing here is a miracle, a sign, and a wonder. It means that Jesus is coming soon because he's gathering back the Jews to Israel so he can return to a Jewish Jerusalem, and he's gathering Jews to himself. We are getting saved. We're coming to faith in more numbers than any time since the book of Acts. That's a sign. It's a wonder. It means that everything in the book, because it's the only book of predictive prophecy on the planet, God says it, then he does it, are we going to believe it? It's the only book on the planet that came out of eternity into time. And so he's fulfilling that. So Cyrus was the golden age of Persia. And about 60 years later, another king arose 
complicated Hebrew name. We'll call him King Xerxes in Greek. But he rose, and he had in his command, the second in command was a man named Haman. Now, when we act out the play, which I'm not going to have you do today because it will slow us down. We act out the play. Whenever you say the name of Haman, you go, boo, and you make noises, and you blow the stuff. When you say Mordechai, you go, yay. Right? So it's a real fun holiday. But Haman was the number two in the land. He had a lot of power. And he is from a lineage that God noticed back at the time of Moses and put his finger on. It's the time of Amalek. And Haman is a descendant of Amalek. I'm saying this to say that there are, just as there are generational things we deal with in our own families, anybody? We deal with generational stuff. We are raised in a family that has a lineage, that has certain proclivities and problems, and sometimes we see them manifesting in our own lives. I'm a therapist. You can trust me on that. And I'm a person, and I've got that stuff. You can trust me on that. We have these things. Well, there's generational views of this, but God sees it by the Spirit. And he knows and said that Amalek was opposed to Moses when Moses was bringing the people out of Egypt. Remember what Amalek did to you out of Egypt? You shall blot out remembrance of him. You shall not forget. Deuteronomy 25, 17. I will be at war with the Amalekites from generation to generation. Exodus 17, 14. Now, we don't need to take up swords because we have to take the spiritual application of these things. But God knows what he's doing. He knows who's who and what's what. He knows the end from the beginning. And that's what this is about. He knew the spirit of Amalek would be coming after the people of Israel through generations. If you go fast forward to 1 Samuel, the time of Saul. Am I going too fast? I'm trying to get it all in between. You know. I just scared myself. I thought, I'm probably scared. I'm killing. It's okay, right? Okay. You go forward in time from Moses to David. And Saul arose as king before David. Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king of over his people over Israel. Now therefore listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself, set himself against him on the way while he was coming out from Egypt. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah to Shur which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, an Amalekite king, the king of the Amalekites alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them. Moses had Amalek. Fast forward through time, Saul has Agag, the descendant of Amalek, Fast forward to 484 B.C., and Mordecai has Haman, also an Agagite. True, same spirit at work, and it's the spirit that resists the things of God. Some of you have felt resistance in the spirit to trying to manifest the things of God in your lives. It's a spiritual battle. I heard a prayer this morning about the warfare in the heavenlies. I heard that more than once here. There are resistance to you. You're, by the way, married couples, your spouse is not your enemy. Just an aside. Sometimes they look like it, but they are not your enemy. You do have an enemy. There is an enemy that wants to, draw, wants to destroy your house. No question, but it's not your spouse. Some days are better than others, obviously. Okay. 60 years after Cyrus, Haman violates Genesis 12.3. Genesis 12.3 tells us that the one who mocks or despises the Jewish people, the one who treats them as of little consequence, the one who says that God is finished with them, that is the exact sense of the Hebrew word used in that p- passage, he will be cursed by God. You cannot touch the apple of God's eye, which is Israel. Now, I know we use that as believers. We've got a lot of promises we borrow. And I say, yes, let's borrow them. But let's also remember to put them back where they belong. Because there's a context for the promises of God. And part of this is a long love story that starts before creation, because the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, goes into the garden where there's a wedding, and it's going all the way through this line of history, through this little group of people that is now touching the entire world, because God blessed the entire world through the Jewish people. Jesus said, salvation is of the Jews, because he is a Jew. He didn't invent a new religion. I, now, I was raised in New York. There was the Catholics and the Jews. My friends were Italian Catholics, and we were Jews. And... We hung out. 
they were sure that they had a vastly superior theology. And one time, Sal Spampanato proved that by punching Al Goldstein in the nose at the candy store. And so we kind of figured, okay, maybe they know something. But, but mostly we thought this was an other. We could believe in anything. When I, before I came to Jesus, I was a Boo Jew. I was meditating in the desert with Jack Cornfield and Joseph Goldstein, the other Buddhist Jews. And I was full into Hinduism and a Hindu view of the world, a completely new age. <laughs> I discovered I was at two with the universe. <laughs> And Jesus called me by name. Yeah. And, and so we grow up with this sense of other. There's Jewishness and Christianness, and they're very different. I grew up thinking that Jesus was his first name and Christ was his last name. He was born to Mr. and Mrs. Christ, and they lived somewhere near the Vatican. And it was a completely other thing that we, do, we can do anything well, but just not that. That's not what we do. All right? So when he starts to reveal himself and who he is in his natural state and what that means about the salvation of the world, not only has our rejection built, been the salvation of the world, what will our acceptance be but life from the dead? And as the Jews are coming back to the Lord, we're seeing revival all around the world because things are getting quicker and closer to the return of the, of the Messiah. And you can hear things, and I'll write about them in my newsletter. You really should get connected with us. I'll filter a lot of the junk that you have to deal with on the internet in terms of what's really going on, what's really true. I've got sources, highly placed sources within Israel that give me the stuff. And I can kind of read into it because I'm there enough of the time. But we need to know that there's an amazing, amazing worldwide revival taking place in the midst of what is obviously darkness growing. The darker it gets, the brighter you shine. And you're shining as lights. And I'm grateful that you're shining as lights right here in Little Nevada, I'll tell you that. So, so the story of Esther is a story of an attempt to destroy the Jewish people, which is a history that takes place all the time. You know, it goes throughout history. And our, our joke is that every holiday, hey, they tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. <laughs> That's the shorthand version of all the biblical feasts. But God has a calendar. He has a biblical calendar. It's not the Julian Gregorian calendar that we use. I'm for it. I celebrate New Year. Whatever, but that's not God's calendar. He has one. And Purim is an extra biblical holiday, but we're commanded to keep it because of what it does in commemorating the faithfulness of God. And if there's anything you take from these messages that I bring about the Jewish roots of the faith, it's that this. If God can preserve his people, plant them back in their land after 2,000 years, make the most thriving, only democratic country in the Middle East with peace and justice for all who want it. But folks, there are two million Arab Israeli citizens living with a better standard of living and with better... We were doing television in Israel, and my driver was a Bedouin, a devout Muslim. Five times a day, we'd have to stop the car so he could pray. It's okay. Sweet guy. He said, Miles, where your people rule, order. Where my people rule, chaos. Arab Israeli citizens are prospering, prospering, and prospering. Do not believe the so-called boycott, divest, and, and sanction movement that is trying to strip the economy from Israel. It is a lie. It is a lie. The prosperity of Israel is good for the entire nation and all the surrounding people, everybody that joins the, to them. It's the only place in the Middle East where there's freedom of religion. It's the only place where Christians and Jews and Muslims can pray any way they want to. We go twice a year. We're going to go once this year. We go in the fall. We've taken, we've got, we have two spots left, which kind of blew my mind. We have, we have 48 people signed up for the fall. We try to take one bus. I've done two and three buses, and it's, it's too hard. I like to take 50 or fewer. You should come to Israel. It will enrich your faith uh, beyond anything. Now, we will go in the fall to this next one, and then we probably won't go again until 2021. So you have plenty of time to save your shekels. All right. Haman said to king... To the king Xerxes, there's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples of all the provinces of your kingdom whose laws differ from those of every other people and do not obey the king's laws. Point number one, the Jews are different and live their lives separately. Watch out. I'll, say, I'll apply it to the church. Pressure. 
Pressure on a kid at Berkeley. Pressure on you in your workplace. Pressure on you wherever you are to water down and to live the ways of the world instead of keeping the faith in the way that God intends us to. Amen? Amen. That's a true story. So the Jews are the example of that. The, this Haman goes to the king and says, these people are dangerous. Watch out for them. You Christians, you're dangerous. You, you got hate speech. You got hate this. You got hate that. Blah, blah, blah. And you're ministers of reconciliation. Isaiah 5, chapter, Isaiah 2 verse 5 says, they will call, the day is coming when they will call evil good and good evil. And that's the day we're living in. So then Haman says this, it is not in the king's interest to tolerate them. In other words, the Jews are suspected of having dual loyalties. Well, are you for America or for Israel? Are you a du dual loyalist? Are you for America or Israel? What's the answer? Same as Joshua 5. Do you come, in the, do you come for us or our enemies? Are you for us or our enemies? Neither. I come in the name of the captain of the host of the Lord. You know, I'm not coming to take sides. I'm coming to take... And for Christians, there is a dual loyalty because we have a biblical mandate to see the restoration of Israel. It's not political. It's biblical. I don't want to be politically correct, but I'd like to be biblically accurate. And the fact is that Jerusalem is mentioned a thousand times in the Bible. The restoration of Israel is a common theme that goes throughout to which you are grafted in, according to the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, you're grafted into the, the commonwealth of Israel. You who are far off, he says, are brought near by the blood of Messiah. And you're, gra you're brought into the commonwealth of Israel. And in Romans 9, 9 through 11, he speaks very specifically about this grafting process. That those natural branches that were broken off can be grafted in. You've been grafted. When you come to Israel, we'll go to the Garden of Gethsemane. You'll see these old trees, 1,200 years old. People say they're from the time of Jesus. They're not. It's okay. The same guy who says, hey, come here, shop where Jesus shopped. Um, <laughs> these trees are old, and the best fruit, I asked a horticulturist, the best fruit comes when you take a wild olive and you graft it into one of these old trees, the old tree of Israel. And when the tree gets old, it gets hollow on the inside. What happens is the shoots grow up from the root, and they wrap themselves around. If you go online, you'll see trees, and they look like they have these striations around them because the shoots grow up. What's a shoot? Hebrew word netzer. It's where we get Nazareth. It's where we get Nazarene. The shoots are the believers in Jesus. They grow up around the roots of the olive tree, and they support it against the winds of adversity. So I asked this guy, well, how do you get good fruit? What's the best fruit from an olive tree? So, well, you take a wild olive, and you graft it into a natural tree. I said, you've got to be kidding me. He said, oh, that's the best way. I said, well, how do you do? He said, you make a cross in the tree. And you graft in the wild olives and the fruitfulness increases. Folks, we're on a journey. This is keep getting more amazing. And then Haman says, if it's pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business. The king said to Haman, the silver is yours, and the people also do with them as you please. Jewish people's finances. There's a lot of talk about how we control the world, control the world banking system. We're in charge of everything. I would like a piece of that. <laughs> I'm just trying to pay my mortgage. I would love a piece of that world domination because I ain't got it. But there is always a movement to loot the wealth that Jews do acquire. Nazi Germany, well, heck, uh, Spanish Inquisition. Crusades, Nazi Germany, pogroms in Europe, and now BDS in our world. Let's get their wealth. Let's take what's theirs for ourselves. And wars are fought, of course, over money and resources. So this, this anti-Semitism that's up now in the news and in, in our Congress, it's always there in a latent form. It's very blatant now. It's satanic in origin. It's anti-Bible. It's not prim primarily anti-Jew. It's anti-God, anti-Bible. I'm going to cut to the chase. Mordecai calls Esther, his niece, and he says, she's chosen to be the king. She replaces Vashti, the king's wife, and she is now the, the queen of the, of the kingdom. And the, the king offers her everything he has up to half of the kingdom. She's this beautiful young Jewish girl. She's been in hiding. She's been hiding herself, not letting them know that she's a Jew. I would say some Christians are hiding themselves, not letting people know that they're a believer. That's why I'm so encouraged when I hear prayers in grocery lines. 
you know, step out. Just be an encouragement to somebody. Who knows where that would lead? You know, God's economy is different than ours, folks. We give ourselves to a bigger purpose, and he takes care of us in strange ways. First time I went on the mission field in Africa, my mom got saved in California. I preached here for 10 years before that. I said, Mom, before you help me buy a house or anything like that, uh, I need you to know that uh, I'm becoming a, a, a Jew for Jesus. She said, I know all about that stuff. It's a guy in my building in Florida. He does Bible studies with the old ladies. But for 10 years, she resisted the gospel. Now, I'm on the mission field in Bangi, Central African Republic, in 110 degree heat, trying to set up a gospel crusade type meeting, gospel campaign. And my mom is at a rest home here. She was losing her faculties. I had my mom in diapers and my son in diapers at the same time, and I couldn't do that to my wife any longer, so we found a really nice place. And she was there, and my church would go in every week with a Bible study. She gets the altar, raise, she raises her hand. The young man goes up to her and says, Hannah, do you know what you're doing? He says, she says, she looks at her and says, just don't tell Miles. <laughs> she got saved. Her, her demeanor changed, her attitude changed, everything about her changed. She ended her life in a, in a happier state. And the last face she recognized was my wife's. The, the dreaded Gentile bride that took the Jewish prince, blah, blah, blah. You know, that was who she, who she related to the most. Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine, tell Esther, don't imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. You have brought, been brought into the king's time as this. It is not an accident that you are alive and well on planet earth right now because you have a message. God has given you something that he wants to disperse abroad. And Esther is the picture of the church. The church in the last days, standing up for right standing up for israel for sure but also standing up for the body of christ around the world we work with the underground church in china and and we work with the persecuted christians in in the middle east and i asked my friend the point man for brother yun the heavenly man out of china who was our partner there i, I asked my friend he's an american former marine sniper with jason Bourne, the right guy for the job sending missionaries from china into the muslim world i said i said brother what's it like to be surrounded by these, these heroes, you know, that are willing to give their lives so easily. He says, Miles, it's like training for a marathon and stepping up to the starting line and looking around and you're surrounded by Kenyans. <laughs> <laughs> You've been brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. He says it like this. Umiyo dea im le'et katsot higa'at lamachut. Who knows? whether you have been brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. And she says, va'aditi, va'aditi, if I perish, I perish. Because she has to go in before the king. He can't rescind a, a previous decree, so he has to make a new decree. If, he, if she approaches and he does not have favor on her, she can be executed. So she says, va'aditi, va'aditi, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to do this anyway. I'm going to do what God has called me to do anyway. Sometimes it's easier to face the possibility of getting stoned in northern India. I don't mean stoned like I used to get stoned. I mean like stoned to death, like the old school kind of stoning, right? And we were facing that in India one time, and I thought, this is not going well. And I was fasting, and my wife was over here praying, 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 praying. And uh, I said, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to get up and stand with the preacher because they're after him. I was the video guy. So I'll, I'll go up and stand with him. So if he's going to die, I'll stand with him. Now, I am not a brave person. It was just something that came over me that was not of me. And I had this experience of if I perish, I perish. But it's like God wrapped me in fire. And I thought, well, okay, whatever happens. If it's, this is it, this is it. If not, not. Now, I'll tell you what. That's easier sometimes than getting yelled at in Starbucks <laughs> for being a Christian or getting put down at work, or, or get, you know, all the stuff we deal with on a daily basis, it, it's almost harder, I think, to live the life on a basic level every day and be a light than it is to do something that seems very dramatic and kind of, you know, Hollywood. It, it, it was just, it was totally other. It was the Lord, 
right? It was a decision I made. It was just kind of, okay, here we go. By the way, I lived. <laughs> I said that to, to, to give you comfort, you know, that you, you, you ha- you ha- you've been empowered. You've been called. There's lots of ways to do this. You know, you, you do it by partnering with people that are on the front lines and traveling. You can help Catherine and me. You know, you can absolutely partner with us. We would love that. We want to resource people. We want to help people understand where they come from in the faith. We want to be a resource for you. We want to be also get your help to go and do what we do, absolutely. And we want to keep you up to date on the things that matter as we see the day of the Lord approaching. So I just want to take a minute here at the end. I told you that strange factions are arising. So I want you to see a a new friend of mine. Uh, He's an imam, a Muslim leader. He is not a Jesus guy yet. Yet. I say that because watch this and see the heart of, a, of a, the potential heart of a Muslim. Greetings and peace be upon you all. My name is Imam Tawhidi. I am here to take a stand against anti-Semitism. I am in Auschwitz in Poland. This is where millions of Jews were killed part of the Holocaust this is just one of the uh, areas that the horrific crimes took place I've just come back from the the first place we visited it's very important that the message goes out that this never happens again that the atmosphere for this is never created again that we do not pave the way for these crimes to happen again. And if there's a specific message and a particular message that I would like to get out from this visit is that the American Congress should be focusing on serving the American people. It should not be a platform for Islamist members of the American government to preach their hate against the Jewish people. The Jewish people will remain a minority and have remained a minority. If this situation continues, then this minority will be persecuted once again. And we need to make sure that this never happens. It is very sad to see what is happening within the American government. People like Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, absolute frauds and Islamists, promoting hatred against the Jewish people. Ilhan does not believe that the Jewish people or the Jewish nation has the right to exist. Shame on her. And shame on those who voted for her and are staying silent. We should do everything we can to promote peace and make sure that the American government does not allow these people that platform. Raise your voices against hatred. Become people who love. I never thought that I would ever come here and pay my respects. I was someone who hated the Jews and the Jewish nation. It's time we woke up and became human beings for real. Thank you. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. That gives me hope, folks. I'll tell you, there's nothing, and you know, he's going to come to faith. There's nothing more powerful than Muslim background. They've seen the darkness, and when they see the light, and this is kind of like, it reminds me of me on my journey. There's a little bit at a time here and there now and then. You know, this guy has had a revelation, a revelation. So the next step is that Jesus is the Messiah, right? And it's happening all over the Muslim world. I wanted you to see that, to encourage you. Two things. One is we need to pray for our government. We also need to pray, change their hearts or change their seats. This these modern versions of imprecatory prayers. You know, like, hey, if they're going to do this, get them out. It's kosher. It's a kosher prayer. You know, we, we're, we're very nice. We're nice people. We're very nice people. We're very, very nice. Uh, we, we have to have that warring spirit in our prayers. To, to, to not let America go the way that it's headed right now. It's headed towards a European style of potential socialism and uh, Muslimization, Islamization. Folks, I know it doesn't seem possible because we're Americans, but it didn't seem possible for Europe, and Europe's in trouble. Now, within that, there's all kinds of great stuff happening there, revival pockets and all kinds of wonderful stuff happening. But that same uh, threat, this unholy alliance of radical Islam and socialist humanism 
are finding each other in a way that is, is crushing. It's kind of like Herod, the, the political and, uh, excuse me, Pilate, the political, and Herod, the religious, at the time of Jesus. It's this confluence, this, this connection that is pressure against believers and against the truth of God. So we need to pray. For this reason, these days were called Purim, from the word pur, P-U-R, it means a lot. And Purim, I am in every Hebrew word is, uh, is uh, plural. Interestingly, Yerushalayim is the Hebrew for Jerusalem, which means we don't know this as Jews, but it means Jerusalem above and Jerusalem below, right? Two Jerusalems. But Purim, because the, they, they cast lots to see what day to kill all the Jews, and God overturned it, because he overturns things in our life. The Jews established it upon themselves, upon their descendants, and all who joined them, they would commemorate these two days in the way prescribed at the appointed time every year. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and every city. These days of Purim should not fall from among the Jews, nor their remembrance perish from their descendants. So here's the final word. You are Esther. God is calling you out of wherever you've been hiding, whatever gar garb you on to hide the fact that you are a royal priesthood. You're chosen by God to be a light in this world. He's not going to make you uncomfortable in the sense of putting you in danger necessarily, but he is calling us to be light wherever we are. And that's what Esther finally did. At first she was hiding, and then she stepped forward. God's calling you forward today. He's calling you to, to keep calm and Esther on. I see that. All right. Why don't you stand? I'm going to say a blessing over you. Hallelujah. If you're here today and you don't have a living relationship with Jesus, do not leave here without him. There will be prayer people here and pastors. Yeah, thanks. Uh, to pray with you if you have a need in your body or your emotions. And I'll be in the back there if you want to talk to me or sign up for stuff or get free stuff. We got, we got it all happening. Hallelujah. So this prayer goes back to Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 28. And, and God told Moses to have Aaron stand before the people. And he said, whenever this is prayed, I will put my name upon the people and send them out with a blessing. So we have received this as for generation to generation. This is not just for the Israelites or the Jewish people. I believe as we are in faith together that God wants to put his name on you and send you out with a blessing. So just close your eyes. Receive this from the Lord. Don't look at me, please. Yivarecha Adonai v'yismarecha Ya'ea Adonai panavalecha v'yichonecha Yisaha Adonai panavilecha V'yisem lecha Shalom Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his face upon you to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, lift his countenance upon you, and grant you his shalom. May you see his face and hear his voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. May you take confidence from his keeping power, his ability to bring that which he's promised to fruition in your life. And thank you, Lord, in Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.